皆様。Thank you for waiting, ladies and gentlemen. We would like to now open the international symposium hosted by the government of Japan on the occasion of the North Korean Human Rights Abuses Awareness Week. I will be serving as the MC. My name is Miyata Aiko. Very pleased to be here. Those who are in person at the venue, those who are viewing on the web, we thank you all for joining this event and showing your interest towards the abduction issue despite the timing being a very busy time of the year at year end. Like we did last year, official channel of the headquarters for the abduction issue will be offering Japanese live streaming for this event. And should you like to listen in English or Thai, you will be able to obtain the link at the official website of the headquarters for live streaming. We have families of the abductees at the venue. If it is not a problem for you, can you stand? Thank you very much. We also have a family of missing persons, probably related to North Korea. And despite their busy schedule, we have parliamentarians at the venue. House of Representatives, LDP, Mr. Yamada Kenji. House of Representatives, Constitutional Democratic Party, the Honorable Matsubara Jin. House of Councilors, LDP, uh, the Honorable Akaike Masaki. House of Representatives, LB, LDP, the Honorable Sugita Mio. House of Councillors, LDP, the Honorable Takinami Hirofumi. House of Councillors, Komeito Party, Honorable Takeuchi Shinji is represented by his parliamentarian assistant. Let me explain to you the program for this event. There will be two parts. Part one will feature the commendation ceremony for the essay competition to highlight the North Korean Human Rights Abuses Awareness Week. And in part two, international symposium will be conducted. I hope you all can stay until the very end. Now, without further ado, I would like to start part one, commendation ceremony for the essay competition on the abduction issue. In order to achieve an early resolution of the abduction issue, it is important for the Japanese people to be united and show a strong will for the early return of the abductees to the home country. The government is also making efforts to raise awareness of the abduction issue. In this context, we are holding an essay contest for junior high and high school students throughout Japan to raise awareness of the issue of human rights violation in North Korea. By applying to the essay contest, students will learn about the abduction issue through watching films and stage plays related to the abduction issue and reading books on the matter. We hope that this program will be an opportunity for young students to think deeply about what they can do to help solve the abduction issue. This year, we received 2,635 entries for the junior high school category, high school category, and the English essay category. And as a result of rigorous screening, we have selected one grand prize winner, two award of excellence winners, and three special award winners in the junior high school and high school categories. And in the English essay competition, two essays, one of which from junior high school and high school students were selected. In addition, schools that actively participate in the essay context will receive a group award. First of all, we'd like to introduce the schools that won the group award. This group's group award winners are Tosu Public Junior High School, Tosu City, Saga, Saga Prefecture, Chukyo Public Junior High School, Fukuoka Prefecture, Sonobe Public Junior High School, Nantan City, Kyoto Prefecture, Takinogawa Girls Senior High School, 
大志ハイスクール熊本プリフェクチャー今治北ハイスクール愛媛プリフェクチャー福井パブリックジュニアハイスクールアナンシティ徳島プリフェクチャー Group award winners have not been invited to the awards ceremony but will receive their certificates by mail at a later date. Now, we will move to the presentation of awards to the students who have been selected for the grand prize and the award of excellence. May I kindly ask the award winners to come up to the stage? Your Excellency, Minister Matsuno, in charge of the abduction issue, please come up on the stage. We will start with the junior high school category. The grand prize goes to Daigo Junior High School, Narashino City, Chiba Prefecture. Ms. Kiara Yoshida. Ms. Yoshida Kiara. Please come to the center of the stage. Certificate of Commendation. Junior High School Category, Grand Prize. Daigo Junior High School, Narashino City, Chiba Prefecture, First Grade. Ms. Kiara Yoshida. I hereby commend you for receiving the grand prize in the 2022 essay contest for the North Korean Human Rights Violations Awareness Week, sponsored by the government's headquarters for the abduction issue after going through a rigorous screening process. December 10, 2022, Minister in Charge of the Abduction Issue, Matsuno Hirokazu. Next, award for excellence goes to Sonobe Junior High School, Nantan City, Kyoto Prefecture, Ms. Kawakatsu Rise. Please come to the center of the stage. Another winner of the Excellence Award in the Junior High School category is Tokai University Takanawa Dai Junior and Senior High School, First Grade, Ms. Ueda Karin. Now, To the high school category. The grand prize goes to Kansai Soka High School, third grade, Ms. Matsumoto Yumi. Excellence Award winner is Fukushima Myojo Meisei, Meisei High School, Fukushima Prefecture, Ms. Sato Hiyori. And the other winner of the excellent award is. Atsugi Higashi High School, Kanagawa Prefecture, first grade, Ms. Nakagawa Akari. Ms. Nakagawa, unfortunately, was not able to attend the ceremony. Moving on to the English essay category, the winner of the grand prize is Saijo Ehime Prefecture, Rural High School, Ms. Takeuchi Mayu. Award for this category goes to 
福井 Public Junior High School, Anan City, Tokushima Prefecture, Third Grade, Mr. Hiroshima Masaaki. Unfortunately, Mr. Shinohama was unable to attend the ceremony. Award for Excellence goes to Taketa Junior and Senior High School, First Grade, Miss Murayama Kaho. Thank you very much for joining me in a big round of applause. Now, for the media in the venue, we would like to take a photo. May I ask the minister to come to the center of the stage? And award winners, please come around the minister with a certificate of commendation in your hand. We will start with the steel cameras. And now to the movie cameras. Thank you very much. And with this, we would like to conclude the photo session. Minister Matsuno, thank you very much. Please find your way off the stage, Minister. The best essay award winners, Yoshida Kiara san, Matsumoto Yumi san, and Takeuchi Mai san will read their essays. Yoshida san and Matsumoto san had actually gone on a tour to take a look at the site where Yokota Megumi san was abducted, and therefore, after they read their essays, they will share with us their impression. First of all, the best essay award winner of the junior high school uh, division. Yoshida Kiara-san, please. To hear her voice say, I'm back. Yoshida Kiara, 7th grade, Narashino Municipal, 5th Junior High School. I'm going to school. Those were the last words heard by the family of then 13-year-old Ms. Yokota Megumi. 45 years ago, on November 15, 1977, before she went missing on her way back from junior high school. Viewing the animation, Megumi and the company Yasokai's theater performance, Vow to Megumi, Gain Her Back, the viewing triggered me to think deeply about the abductions issue, discovering that Megumi, when she was the same age as myself, was kidnapped and learning about the horrifying truths over abductions by North Korea, I could no longer think of the issue as someone else's problem. It was heart-wrenching to imagine that suddenly, one day, the happy life with family and friends was taken away to be forced to live in North Korea. My heart ached as I thought how Megumi felt. I was left without words to describe the pain. <laughs> At the same time, I was reminded of my own life, filled with so much happiness. Things that I usually take for granted, the happiness of commuting to school every day, the happiness of being able to have a warm meal, the happiness of being able to wear the clothes I like. My life is full of freedom and happiness. I learned that the little things that made me happy, which I took for granted, were in fact the biggest happiness of my life. So maybe what I can do as a junior high school student is to value and live through my ordinary everyday life. What else can we do to prevent the abduction issue from being forgotten? 
showing the DVD at school to pass on the effort to solve this issue to the future generation. Now that we live in an internet society, we can deliver the information to people of Japan and around the world to deepen their understanding. Or, as I did, use that will lead a nation in the future can write essays on the issue by learning the truth of abductions and tell the story to the future generation. Those are the things I intend to do. Regrettably, in addition to abduction, there are many incidents of human rights violation around the world. I have recently heard of bias and discrimination against those who become infected with COVID-19. There are human rights violations involving people being hurt by inconsiderate verbal attacks. Whatever the form, human rights violation is impermissible. This reminded me of the importance of caring my actions and speech as I communicate with friends, classmates, and family. As I viewed the DVD Megumi, one line struck me. These were words spoken by Sakie, Megumi's mother. We do not have any remorse or negative feelings against the people of North Korea. All we want to do is to save and gain back our daughter who still remains in custody in North Korea as her parents. I was impressed by Sakia's strength, how she managed to deliver those words, even as she suffers from deep despair. Megumi's father, Shigeru, unfortunately passed two years ago without reuniting with Megumi. The words that the family of Megumi and the people of Japan are eager to hear are, I'm back by Megumi. I truly pray for a bright future when Megumi, in her beautiful voice, delivers those words. Now, let me share with you my impression after having gone to the site. 26th of November, on this day, I went to the site where she was abducted. It is an 800 meter distance from her school she used to commute, and I walked along to the coast. The wave was very calm, the sea was calm, but my heart was not calm. I had viewed the anime Megumi, and that scene never left my brain. Forty-some years ago, she was abducted at this very coast beach, and I, my heart ached. And also near the beach, there was the shrine, Bokoku Shrine, and in front of that, there was a billboard seeking information on Megumi. After 45 years, the abduction issue remains unsolved, and I was faced with that reality. I hope that abduction is resolved as soon as possible so that this billboard is no longer necessary. Abduction happened before I was born. And the interest amongst our generation has declined. There are so many people who don't know about it. In order to prevent this problem from being forgotten, what can I do? How can I act? And how can I sympathize with the pains of people who are suffering? I will think about that. Next, high school category, grand prize winner, Ms. Matsumoto Yumi. Each and every one of us, human rights. Matsumoto Yumi. The Yokota family lived together as a close-knit family, but one day, the normal, everyday life was suddenly taken away. The hands of the clock stopped since that day. I have always believed that abductions are absolutely unforgivable and that the abductees must have felt so scared and alone that it is hard to imagine how they must have felt at that time. I have also thought that it is only natural that the families of the abductees who have lost their loved ones would want them to return home as soon as possible. On the other hand, however, 
I have also wondered whether the abductees would really feel happy to return to Japan since they must have built relationships with people in North Korea after being there for so many years. However, learning about the abduction issue changed my mind. As I watched the animations and read the materials, I realized how little I knew about the abduction issue to my shame. In particular, the fact that people were forced to work as an educator for Asians in North Korea was very shocking. How painful it must have been for the family to know that their loved one had been forced to help commit crimes. I also read an interview with Mr. Hasuike, who miraculously managed to return to Japan. In the interview, he said, the only freedom I had in, North, in the North was the freedom to think, and the art of self-preservation was to make clear distinction between true feelings and public stance. I was reminded once again that it is a country that totally disregards the two words of human rights. Knowing these facts, I have changed my mind that not only the families of the abductees who are waiting for their return, but also the abductees themselves must miss Japan and longing to go back to Japan where human rights are guaranteed. There must be people, many people who, like me, think they understand what is going on, knowing only on the surface that Japanese nationals have been adopted by North Korea and that the families and the government are working to bring them home. Of course, it is very important for people to know this fact. If they don't know, nothing will happen. However, this alone will not solve anything. People need to understand that abductions are a state crime, that the victims are in many different countries, that each person's precious lives is suddenly taken away and are forced to live without human rights which are indispensable for people to live. The day will come decades from now when abductees and their families are gone. However, even when that day comes, we must not let the statute of limitations appear on this, expire on this matter as something that has happened in the past. The feelings of isolation, loneliness, bitterness, anger, and hope that the abductees and their families must have felt must be carried on. And we must show them in society through our own actions to protect the human rights of each and every one of us. Next is my impression of what I saw at the site. 26th of November, I went to the school Yori School, uh, where uh, Megumi-san uh, was uh, attending, and I also saw the Sea of Japan. It was at daytime, it was warm, and it was bright with sunshine. But Megumi-san was abducted in the evening. She was probably tired after a long day, and it was feeling cold, perhaps. And that made me feel, feel how scared she must have been and how lonely she must have, ha have been. And the last point of uh, Megumi-san's uh, witnessing, the place where she was witnessed last, she was there until the last moment, and yet her friend was no longer able to meet her. It was the usual place to commute, or maybe uh, at dinner time, but no one had seen her at that time. I wondered why. I felt scared because I knew that she was abducted there, but if I did not know, maybe I would not, would not have felt scared. So knowing and not knowing makes a very big difference. And that is why I believe that many people should, more people should know about this issue. Next. Winner of the Best English Essay Award, Takeuchi Mayu-san, please go ahead.
What we should do now? 最上 high school, 11th grade, 竹内真由 Remember a happy birthday party you've enjoyed with your family. Now, imagine that you never see your family again the day after that. This is exactly what Yokota Megumi's family experienced. 45 years have passed since she was abducted by North Korean agent. According to a public opinion poll carried out by the cabinet office in 2017, 85.3% of people in their 60s remained interested in the abduction issue compared to only 64.9% of young people. What should the teenagers do to solve the international issue? I believe we should do two things, develop our knowledge of the issue and take action. First, we must improve our knowledge. When I initially learned about the abduction issue in junior high school, I realized what a gross violation of human rights Megumi's family had suffered. It opened my eyes to the injustice. Since then, I've always asked myself what I can do to resolve this issue. Before writing this essay, I watched the Japanese animation, Megumi. There was a scene that left a deep impression on me. Shigeru, Megumi's father, was given a comb as a birthday present by Megumi on the day before the incident. For 42 years, Shigeru had always carried the gift in his breast pocket. At his funeral, Sakie, Megumi's mother, did not put the comb in Shigeru's coffin. Instead, Sakie decided she would keep hold of it, so if they were ever reunited, Megumi could see that her father had always been thinking of her. I feel strongly that we young people should inherit the determination of Mr. and Mrs. Yokota. We need more opportunities to learn about these struggles. Second, we must take action ourselves. So far, I've always shared what I learned in class with my family. My mother said that she remembers our talk about the adduction issue. It's so important to share opinion with those around us and get them interested in human rights issues. Currently, I'm a member of a committee on human rights education. I hope to hold activities to educate the public during North Korean Human Rights Abuses Awareness Week. I want to tell all the students at school about some events which are available on YouTube. Fortunately, after reading my ideas, my teacher promoted my action and introduced the anime of Megumi in the school newsletter for students and parents. I'm sure that expressing our opinions with those, with those around us and get them interested in the adduction issue. In conclusion, this essay outlines two steps all young people can take, develop our knowledge of the issue and take action. The most important thing in learning about human rights issues is to never give up. I want to increase opportunities for young people to learn by continuing to enlighten them. Moreover, I hope they themselves will spread the knowledge they have learned. For this reason, I want to be a leader who can constantly push myself to learn more. I will continue to research the action issue and strive for a resolution. Thank you for your attention. Congratulations to the grand prize winners, Ms. Yoshida, Ms. Matsumoto, and Ms. Takeuchi. The award-winning essays are displayed in the foyer today. We will also post them in the national newspapers and on the website of the headquarters for the abduction issue of the Cabinet Secretariat at a later date. Please take a look. And with this, we conclude the award ceremony for essay competition on the abduction issue. Congratulations to all the winners. Thank you. May I kindly ask the recipients to return to your seats. Now, please bear with us for a moment until we prepare the stage. Thank you for staying. We would like to now begin the International Symposium, International Cooperation to Resolve the Abduction Issue as a Global Challenge. 
On behalf of the organizers, I would like to call Mr. Matsuno Hirokazu, Chief Cabinet Secretary and Minister in Charge of the Abduction Issue for remarks. I am Matsuno Hirokazu, Chief Cabinet Secretary and Minister in Charge of the Abduction Issue. On the occasion of the International Symposium hosted by the Government of Japan in the North Korean Human Rights Abuses Awareness Week, I would like to thank those of you here at the venue, in person, and online viewers. Today's symposium is attended by family members of victims and experts on human rights issues in North Korea from Japan and abroad. I would like to take this opportunity to extend my gratitude to all of you for your participation, including those who will appear via video message in the midst of the COVID pandemic. Since the return of five abductees in 2002, not a single abductee repatriated. My heart aches with pain and remorse for not being able to rescue the victims who have been waiting for too long to return and when I think about the feelings of their families. Mr. Yokota Shigeru and Ms. Arimoto Kayoko passed away the year before last and Mr. Shigeo Izuka last year without being reunited with their families. I had the opportunity to exchange opinions with families of the abductees prior to the symposium today. In the many times I had met with the families, I have heard directly from them about their painful longing to be reunited with their relatives. And I am keenly aware of the sense of urgency that there is not a moment to spare. Abduction is a challenge given highest priority in the agenda of the Kishida cabinet and is a humanitarian issue with time constraints. The only way to break the mistrust that exists between Japan and North Korea, resolve the abduction issue and envision a bright future both sides is for the leaders to build relations at the highest level with Japan taking the initiative. Under the direction of our Prime Minister, we intend to make further efforts to create an environment for this purpose. At the same time, it is also extremely important to gain international support and cooperation during his meetings with leaders of various countries, Prime Minister Kishida calls for support towards immediate resolution of the abduction issue and confirms with his counterparts that they would continue to collaborate closely to bring an end to this issue. I also take advantage of opportunities to meet with foreign dignitaries to seek for their understanding and cooperation towards the immediate resolution of the abduction issue. Last month, the third committee of the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution on the situation of human rights in North Korea, in which Japan was a co-sponsor. Such resolutions have been adopted 18 times during the past 18 years successively, which I believe is an indication that the international community has strong concerns about the abduction issue. And a few hours ago, this morning, Japan time, Consultations were held at the United Nations Security Council on the human rights situation in North Korea. After the meeting, Japan, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Republic of Korea, and other like-minded nations issued a joint statement strongly demanding the resolution of the abduction issue, especially the immediate return of abductees. The following panel discussion will be participated by experts, both of whom were newly appointed to their respective positions last summer. Dr. Elizabeth Salmon, UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in DPRK, and Dr. Lee Xinghua, Ambassador for International Cooperation on North Korean Human Rights of the Government of the ROK. 
they will be consulting to give us advice from the perspective of experts. In order to resolve the abduction issue, it is important for the Japanese people to be united and show our strong will for the early return of all abductees to Japan. In particular, it is important to raise awareness of the abduction issue among the younger generation who, until now, have had little opportunity to be exposed to the issue. We, on the behalf of the government, are strengthening our efforts in this regard. I had the opportunity to observe a class on the abduction issue at Ageo Municipal Higashi Junior High School in Saitama Prefecture in October and had a roundtable discussion with the students who took the class and the teachers who organized the class. That was a great experience. Today, before this symposium, I had a discussion with students of Kagawa University who are engaged in mock classes on the abduction issue who will become teachers in the future and received meaningful suggestions from them. I was also strongly impressed by the powerful messages pre presented by award-winning junior high and senior high school students in the essay contest. Our voices resonating and amplifying through today's symposium will provide a powerful impetus for the resolution of the abduction issue. With your continued support and cooperation, the entire government will do our utmost to ensure the early return of all abductees, regardless of whether or not they have been officially certified. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Minister. Let us turn to the appeal by the families of the victims from in and outside of Japan. Family of victims overseas have kindly sent us a video message, which we will show today. We will start with the young brother of Ms. Yokota Megumi, abductee, and representative of the Association of the Families of Victims Kidnapped by North Korea. Mr. Yokota, please take the stage. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Takuya Yokota, head of the Association of the Families of Victims Kidnapped by North Korea. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule during this busy season of the year to gather here today with a strong determination to bring back to Japan all the victims abducted by North Korea. Since I took over the position of representative of the association from the former representative, Mr. Izuka Shigeo, last December, a year has passed in the blink of an eye. None of our beloved family who were abducted have returned to Japan. Nothing has changed since a year ago. We are still in an environment full of contradictions. Our loved ones are surviving by the day in unimaginably harsh conditions, spending their days suffering, unable to escape from the living hell. When I think of this, I cannot help but feel bitterness and anger. Under such circumstances, I want to express my sincere gratitude to the many young people, students who entered the essay contest and gave some good thought to how the issue of Japan, Japanese abductions by North Korea could be resolved, what they could do, and how each of them should relate to society. They've expressed their thoughts in powerful words. The abductions by North Korea are not a tragedy that happened to the Yokota family, nor is it an issue for the family association alone. North Korea violated Japan's sovereignty in territorial waters and abducted many innocent Japanese with force, including a 13-year-old junior high school student who was on her way home from school. This is a serious violation of human rights. This is an issue that is, is imposed on each and every one of us, and each one of us is being tested. 
In February 2022, we witnessed the Russian invasion of Ukraine. In the 21st century, no one would have thought that unilateral change of the statu quo with force would take place. Peace is easily shattered, and all that is left is a culture, history, and social life, family ties torn apart, and a precarious peace and freedom. This is exactly what North Korea is doing by unilaterally changing the statu quo by force, violently and forcibly separating people from their families and forcing our loved ones to experience what will be likened to hell. There is no way this can be allowed to happen. Why can't the Japanese government strongly engage in diplomatic negotiations with North Korea to resolve this terrible situation? I believe that we, the people of Japan, should unite and strongly argue the Japanese government to do so. We should also speak out more strongly to Chairman Kim Jong-un, return all the abducted Japanese. The Family Association, National Association of the Rescue of a Japanese Kidnapped by North Korea and the Parliamentarians Association on Abduction Issue have one campaign policy, immediate return of all abductees to their home countries. No partial solution or step-by-step -step solution will be accepted. There's no need to set up an investigation committee or liaison office. We do not call for the formulation of a delegation by some politicians to visit North Korea, which is a form of binary diplomacy. North Korea is keeping a close watch on the abductees 24-7 to know when, where, who, and what they are doing. There is absolutely no need to start an investigation assuming they don't know. As long as Kim Jong-un decides to resolve the abduction issue, the whole issue can be resolved immediately. We should not be fooled by their deceptive rhetoric. To this end, Prime Minister Kishida should express to Chairman Kim Jong-un, in his own words and with even greater devotion, that resolving the abduction issue will bring a bright future for both Japan and North Korea. He should also strongly emphasize that the abduction issue must be resolved while the parents' generation is still alive and well. In other words, time is limited. We, the people of Japan, must demand that the Japanese government resolve this issue. It is up to each and every one of us. We, the Association of Families of Victims Kidnapped by North Korea, will continue to appeal for a solution using words as weapons and without bending our principles. We kindly ask for your continued understanding and support. Thank you. Representative Mr. Yokota, thank you very much. Next, we invite the eldest son of abductee, Ms. Taguchi Yaeko, who is Secretary General of the Association of Families of Victims Kidnapped by North Korea. Mr. Koichiro Izuka, please come to the stage. Thank you very much. I know you're very busy at the end of the year. Thank you for being here. And to those who submitted your essays to the competition, uh, we were so impressed by the essays. And thank you for sharing your interest to this issue. One year ago, my adopted father and the eldest brother of Taguchi, Yaeko Izuka Shigeo, passed away when he was 83. For 44 years, he desperately looked for his sister. She, He suffered. He desired for reunification, but without that dream being realized, he passed. He was suffering from multiple diseases in his late years, and his physical strength had declined significantly. And yet, he would not miss meetings with prime ministers, foreign and Japanese dignitaries, town hall events, and events that he thought, thought important by sacrificing his life. I used to say to him, Everyone knows you're failing, so why don't you rest and become more fit to welcome Yaiko when she ultimately returns? He just smiled and said nothing. 
probably he was exposed to pressure as the representative of association of families and sense of losing time without any progress and resolve to meet his brother and his hope to have his adopted son, myself, meet my true mother. So although he was completely fatigued, those mindsets kept him going. But he's no longer with us. He will never meet Yaiko. And I wanted him to be united with Yaiko. And I'm lost. I'm without words. I don't know what to say when she returns to Japan. Approximately 40 years have passed since abduction began in Japan. And in 2002, 2004, uh, five abductees and their families returned, but they're in after no progress. And during these long years, there are parents and siblings that passed away without achieving reunification. Yokota Shigeru-san, Arimoto Kayoko-san passed away in 2020 without being reunited with their daughters. The families awaiting for their uh, abductees to return are aging. Our lives are finite. There's no time to spare. I want the Japanese government to have stronger resolve and sense of speed and be serious about this issue. Wait and see attitude that the Japanese government has taken conventionally is unacceptable. Please take steps to organize the Japan-North Korea summit. Persuade North Korea. North Korea and Chairman Kim Jong-un, please make a decision to repatriate the abductees and their families. Japan will never take positive action to the benefit of North Korea without the resolution of abduction issue, liaison offices, and return of some abductees. Such slow process is unacceptable. And you can't just wait for us to die. We're going to fight until the very end of our lives. And even if there's only one member left in our association, we're going to continue to fight. The Association of Family is seeking the immediate return of all abductees all at once. And if that is achieved, we will never try to ask for secrets from the returnees. We will never object to normalization of ties between Japan and North Korea. All we want is a calm and happy life. North Korea should relieve itself from the past unnecessary restraint, try to have the economic sanctions lifted and partner up with the international community so that it will be able to enjoy prosperity in a constructive manner. Lastly, those of you here at the venue, please continue to show your support and understanding so we can be reunited with the victims. Uh, please continue to support so that I can begin to live with my mother. I can no longer bear losing any more family members. Thank you for the kind attention. Secretary Izuka, thank you very much. Next, we will hear from the sister of Ikushima Takako, Secretary of the Family Association of the Missing Persons, probably related to the DPRK, Ms. Ikushima Keiko. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am the sister of Ikushima Takako, a so-called unidentified missing Japanese probably related to North Korea. My name is Ikushima Keiko. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all those who are present here today for giving me this opportunity to speak. There are no active actions to rescue the unidentified missing Japanese, probably related to North Korea. 
some might pass away in waiting. Try to imagine this if it is happening to yourself. How will the abduction issue be passed on to the future generations? Please think about that. With all due respect, to what extent do the media understand and report the current situation of the unidentified missing Japanese? Another thing is that some of the more than 800 people may have been abducted, may have been abducted not only in the 1970s and 1980s, but uh, even earlier than that, and even in the Heisei era. According to the Private Citizens Group, the Commission on Missing Japanese, probably related to North Korea, seem to see it this way. But I wonder what the government's view is this. There are people who finally returned from the Korean Peninsula at the end of the war, only to find that they have been abducted. There are people who went fishing, but only their boats were found. Or people who went on a trip and never returned. There are different ways in which people have gone missing. Some are now in their 80s, 90s, some are already 100, and some are even older. When discussing the abduction issue, it is often said that the families of the abductees are getting older, but some of the unidentified missing Japanese themselves are getting old. If they are considered unidentified missing Japanese probably related to North Korea, and North Korea insists that they have not entered the country, does that mean that the intention to rescue them is vague and that not only North Korea, but even the Japanese people are waiting for time to run out and their lives come to an end? I hope not. My sister, Takako, went missing on November 1, 1974 in Sasazuka, just one station away from Shinjuku in Tokyo. Fifty years have passed this year. If she is alive today, she will be 81 years old. One year after North Korea admitted that it had abducted Japanese nationals, a person came forward and said that he had lived in the same apartment with my sister. The witness is Wo Ging Nang. He came to Japan and had met my mother on two occasions before she passed away. And he insisted that the person with whom he had conversations with looked just like my mother, so there is no doubt. One day, my mother watched the people returning home on TV, getting off the plane, ramp and hugging their families. She sadly whispered and shrugged, saying, I will never experience this. Her wish unfulfilled she passed away five months later. She was 99 years old and 11 months. My mother died believing that since there are people who say they saw her, of course the country, the government will re bring her home. If you cannot rule out the possibility of abduction, what are you going to do about it? Please explain to us, the family, why you cannot call it an abduction and why the government's view is on this. Three days before my sister Takako went missing, my mother and I were in the hospital room where my mother had been hospitalized for eye surgery. And Takako said, Mom, after you get out of the hospital, stay at my place. I will take care of your hospital visit. What happened to her only three days later? After my mother was discharged from the hospital and the eye patch was removed, she looked frustrated and sad, saying, I can see now, but it's no use if Takachan is not around for me to see her face. The eyewitness information was valuable. Through Japan Red Cross, uh, before the, there, I heard that the family abductees requested an investigation of the missing persons through the Japan Red Cross before the Prime Minister Koizumi visited North Korea. 
I wonder what will happen、uh, with the unidentified missing Japanese, probably related to North Korea. I hope we could be addressed in the same way as Japanese citizens. Although there may be differences in how people think about the abduction issue depending on their position, I believe that all those who have been abducted for no reason must be returned. I sincerely hope that the issue will be resolved through the united efforts of the entire nation. Lastly, but not least, I'd like to extend my deep appreciation for taking the time to listen to what I have to say. Thank you very much. And I count on your continued support. It will be very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Ikushima. We have received a video message from Mr. James Snedon, the brother of David Snedon, who during his study in Belgium went missing in Unnam province when he was traveling in August 2004 uh, with the possibility of having Dear been colleagues, abducted. Please enjoy. Governmental leaders and inquiring individuals therein, but most especially deeply affected abductee family, family members and the citizens of North Korea. My purpose today is to speak to my brother David Steden's disappearance. He's been missing since August 2004 and most likely abducted by North Korea in Yunnan Province, China. David, like many others, was erased in the prime of his life. He was a promising trilingual student at Brigham Young University, having majored in Chinese, having learned Korean fluently while serving a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints, and obviously having been raised speaking English. David was adept, adept in languages, cultures, and international travel. He certainly would have been a curious multilingual Westerner traveling in the outskirts of Yunnan, China. He was an amateur ambassador for cultural awareness and intercultural aptitude, an inquisitive mind, and adept student, a messenger of kindness and service, and in short, he was the best of what humanity has to offer. His life song was snuffed quietly, silently. Ignominiously, coldly, cruelly, not inconsequentially. He left a gaping hole in our family's heart. But more importantly, his abduction has left a chasm in the world, a world ever in need of skillful seekers of and bastions for goodwill amongst disparate cultures and people. No, his disappearance simply hurts humanity. Today I want to pivot to the responsibility of the U.S. government in this cruel life saga. David was abducted nearly 20 years ago. Since then, our family has participated in scores of similar symposiums, given as many speeches, entertained multiple interviews, been queried about tens of documentaries on the subject, spent thousands of hours in the United States Capitol, Washington, D.C., educating polit polit political and NGO leaders while sharing our family's first hand search dossier, <clears throat> verifying ample evidence of life beyond the gorge. And Jing Sha Jing River, the location where the Chinese government's claim David fell and drowned. Simultaneously, we shared increasing evidence and probability of a DPRK abduction. There were multiple credible witnesses who directly and clearly recalled interacting with David well past the river. Having hiked the trail myself, the river is as much as a half to a mile separated from the trail, with a two lane highway in between. It seems rather unlikely to any reasonable person he would fall from the trail and die in the river. Additionally, I personally watched these witnesses, their responses, and even on a few occasions, their countenances, their countenances when speaking of this curious amateur ambassador. They were clear smiles, sparkling eyes, which spoke of their fun but brief memory of this seeker of goodwill, all long after the gorge and river. No, David was not lost in the river. So convincing was this evidence 
the U.S. Congress passed a resolution, Senate Resolution 92, in November 2018. What has become of this resolution? It is now almost exactly five years later, and our family hasn't heard one iota of information or had one single contact with a government individual or institution about the demand, demanded action in this resolution. Where are you, executive and administrative branches of the U.S. government? Sharing excerpts from this resolution should clearly verify and codify the case of David's abduction and requisite action committed therein. In part, it states, <clears throat> Whereas there is evidence indicating that David did not fall into the river when he traveled through the gorge, including eyewitness testimonies from people who saw David alive and spoke to him in person after his hike, as recorded by members of David's family and by embassy officials from the State Department in the months after his disappearance. Whereas family members searching for David shortly after he went missing obtained eyewitness accounts that David stayed overnight in several guest houses during and after his safe hike through the gorge, and these guest house locations suggest that David disappeared after passing through the gorge, but the guest house registers recording the names and passport numbers of foreign overnight guests could not be assessed. I'll clarify this point. By law, all foreign guests are required to register at inns, hostels, and hotels in at least one <clears throat> in at least one occasion. The pages from these dates suspected of David's stay were torn out. In another, the logbooks were removed, expunging them from the records, so to speak. Continuing, whereas Chinese officials have reported that evidence does not exist that David was a member of a, a victim of a violent crime or a resident in a local hospital, prison, or mental institution at the time of his disappearance. And no attempt has been made to use David's passport since the time of his disappearance, nor has any money been withdrawn from his bank account since that time. Whereas a well-reputed Japanese nonprofit specializing in North Korean abductions shared with the United States its experts' analysis in 2012 about information it's, <clears throat> it stated was received from a reliable source that a United States University student largely mapping, uh, matching David Sten's description was taken from China by North Korean agents in August 2004. Whereas, commentary published in the Wall Street Journal in 2013 cited experts looking at the David Sten case who concluded that it is most probable that a U.S. national had been abducted to North Korea and there is a strong possibility that North Korea kidnapped the American. Then it says, resolved that the Senate directs the Department of State and the intelligence community to jointly continue investigations and to consider all plausible explanations for David's disappearance, including the possibility of abduction by the government of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Encourages the State Department encourages the Department of State and the intelligence community to work with foreign governments known to have dip diplomatic influence with the government of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea to better investigate the possibility of the involvement of the government of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in David Sten's disappearance and to possibly seek his recovery, request that the Department of State and the intelligence community continue to work with and inform Congress and the family of David Snedden on efforts to possibly recover David and to resolve his disappearance, etc. What does resolution mean? According to Merriam-Webster's definition B, the act of answering, solving. So my dear Congress, is David's disappearance solved? As elected public officials charged with dutifully representing and protecting citizens, have you acted with resolve to close this matter? <clears throat> have you duly performed your official duties? Have you kept your oath at office? Have you utilized the federal government's resources and flexed international channels, diplomatic or otherwise, to solve David Snedden's disappearance? Emphatically, I say no. So what is the purpose of this resolution, I ask, rhetorically? What kind of resolve do you actually have? Regarding this matter, what kind of trust have you earned to any within earshot of my voice? 
I'll let you each ponder that answer. But as for me and my family, I think we know. You can do better, U.S. government. You must do better and abide by your own resolution. For if the U.S. government, the State Department, the various intelligence agencies, and each and all of those colossal and powerful agencies therein can't keep its word to its citizens, what use is it? I seem to recall an important clause. A government of the people, by the people, for the people. Yes, without that, what is a government's purpose? Yet I believe in you still. I love my country deeply and emphatically. I'm a Midwestern Boy Scout who grew up learning to work on a pig farm and detasseling corn. I believe in you, U.S. government, but you can do better. Please find that resolve again and determine the origin of David Snedden's disappearance. Finally, in closing, I want to return to David's story vis-a-vis the beleaguered North Korean citizen's own plight. David's disappearance left a world chasm, I claim. He was a consummate humanitarian. How many David Snedden's, male or female, are muted, muzzled, silenced, cut down, trodden under, and left speechless and even lifeless by the DPRK government? How many families have missing children, parents, uncles or aunts, friends, without word of proclamation? Think about the immeasurable cost and handicapped national progress the DPRK renders itself to by such despotic, egomaniacal, inhumane, even routine government acts such as abductions, tortures, gulags, and state-sponsored murders. Dear leaders of the DPRK, this only impedes and restrains your own country. I make an appeal to you, just as I did my own government. You can do better. Your citizens are your guiding light, your flowering plant, your daily sunrise on a new tomorrow for hope and prosperity. You, the DPRK government, can, can't force that to happen. No, that's in the hands and the heads of a free-thinking, free-acting, free-choosing people governed by God-given light, morality, and purpose. Let's resolve this abduction issue once and for all. Come join hands with the greater chorus of countries across the 48th parallel and unleash that power, future development, and prosperity of your beautiful citizens. You can do this. We are here when you choose to outreach that hand. Thank you very much. James. That was a video message from Mr. James Nettle. And next is a video message from Panjong Banjoy, nephew of Anochan Panjoy, whose abduction became known in Soga Hitomi's husband, Jenkins, who was abducted in Macau, where he was working in 1978. Please take a look at the screen. Hello. Thank you for this opportunity for me to speak at this event. I am Panjong Banjoy from Thailand. About 45 years ago, Anocha Banjoy was abducted. She was a Thai woman from Sangamben district, Chiang Mai province and she was abducted by the North Korean government. Many years have passed since then. It all began in 1978 when Anocha disappeared from her place of work in Macau. Our family learned of her disappearance from a letter we received from a friend who had gone missing, who had gone to work with her. After that, we did not know who to contact or who to talk to, and all our relatives just had to wait. And 45 years ago, it was very difficult and hard for people in the countryside to travel. And even if we went looking, our family did not have the money to pay for it. And 17 years had passed.
I still remember clearly that on November 1st, 2005, at 7.30 p.m., Skama Panjoy, Anocha's brother and my father, was watching the ITV evening news. The reporter said this, a Thai woman has been adopted by North Korea. Her name is Anocha. My father saw a picture of a woman on the left corner of the TV screen and immediately said, oh, it's Anocha. She's in North Korea. The next morning, my father and I woke up early and went to the county office and told the county manager to get to the bottom of this matter. After that, a reporter contacted us at home. And also, an official from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand visited our house to investigate the truth. My father and I were taken to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and we met with the then Minister of Foreign Affairs. Not long after that, the Japanese government and the National Association for the Rescue of Japanese Kidnapped by North Korea came to visit my father and I at our home in Chiang Mai. And they invited my father and I to an international seminar to be held in Japan in December 2005. Today, it marks exactly 18 years since that day. During that time, my father and I have submitted petitions to several prime ministers, and we met with representatives of numerous relevant government agencies, but the response has always been the same. They would say, I will support you in every way I can, so please hang in there. That was all we heard. Then, for the next 10 years, starting from 2015, my father and I, as the victim's brother and nephew, did everything in our power to search for our sister and aunt so that she can come home. My father, as a brother, did everything he could to help for the sake of his beloved sister. On May 1st, 2015, Friday, at 1.30 p.m., Anocha's brother and my father, Sukam Anocha, Skamupanjoy passed away peacefully in his sleep. He never had the chance to see his sister's face, but he passed away with the hope that his sister will one day be able to return to her hometown. Before he passed away, my father told me to take care of my mother, to take care of my siblings, and to protect their home with care and devotion, and never to give up on Aunt Pa. Aunt Pa is Anocha. Go check and see if she is still alive. If you can't go, then do your best to find her and bring her home. My father said, I may not be able to help you much longer, but don't give up. I promised my father that I would do everything I could to help. I would do everything I can to find Aunt Pa, and I will continue to do so. It has been 45 years since she disappeared. There's been no progress in this matter, and I have not heard from any agency. Thai society is clearly divided between the rich and the poor. And my family and I have always thought of this this way. Anocha is the daughter of a poor farmer. She is from the countryside. No one is interested in her. No one offers to help her. But if Anocha were from a wealthy family, if her name were known in society long ago, Anocha would have been able to return to her hometown. Currently, 
Our families wish to find Anocha is supported by the Japanese government and the National Association for the Rescue of Japanese Kidnapped by North Korea. The families of all abductees by North Korea, including victims of the right to liberty and human rights, still exist in this world. However, with COVID, everyone is facing challenges and difficulties. COVID has affected us all. My family and I thought there would be no one left to help us with this problem. Yet, against all odds, this international seminar is being held today. There are still people who understand the suffering of all the families of the abductees by North Korea. There are still people who are there for us. No one has given up on this issue yet. Thanks to all of you in this event, I still have hope for this issue. I hope we can all meet again. And finally, I would like to thank you all on behalf of the Bonjoy family and myself. And I want to thank everyone from the media for attending today's event. Thank you. In this, we have come to the end of the appeal by the family of victims. We are now going to take a 10-minute break. We will be resuming from 3.30 in 10 minutes. Please be back in your seats by then. Thank you. As it is time, I'd like to start part two, International Symposium on International Collaboration to Resolve the Abduction Issue as a Global Challenge. And we would like to start the panel discussion. I would like to ask the moderator to moderate the session. Professor Nishino will be serving as the moderator from Keio University. Professor Nishino is an expert on East Asian international politics, Japan-Korea relations, and the Korean Peninsula. And he is the author of many books and have made numerous media appearances. Over to you, Professor Nishino. Thank you for the kind introduction. I am Nishino of the Legal and Political Faculty of Keio University. I am very happy to be here, to be serving as the moderator. We would like to discuss the international cooperation to resolve the abduction issue as a global challenge. We have the most fitting members Two of them for this international symposium were happy to have them. Let me introduce them and then ask each panelist to deliver their presentation for 10 minutes. And after that, I would like to ask a few questions to ask them to respond to my questions. We are planning to conclude at 4.15, so it will be a rather lengthy discussion, but we hope that you stay until the very end. Let me introduce to you the panelists. First of all, sat next to me is Dr. Elizabeth Somon, UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the DPRK. Special Rapporteur Somon was appointed the fourth Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in DPRK in August this year. From 1997, she has been teaching as a professor at a Pontifical Catholic University of Peru. She also served important positions such as legal advisor to UNDP, legal advisor to the International Criminal Court, and chairperson of the UN, UN Human Rights Council Advisory Committee. And on her left, all right, is Dr. Lee Shin Hwa, Ambassador for International Cooperation on North Korean Human Rights of the ROK government. Ambassador Lee was appointed to her current position by the ROK government in July of this year. 
Since 2008, she has been teaching as a professor of international relations at Korea University. She was a special advisor to former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan on the independent inquiry on the Rwandan genocide and former board member of the UN Secretary General's Peace Building Fund. Ambassador Li Xinhua is very active on the global stage. Thank you to the two of you for being here. Now, let's proceed to the presentations by the two panelists, and you are given 10 minutes each. First, Special Rapporteur Salmon, please go ahead. 10 minutes. The floor is yours. It's OK. Excellency, family members of the abduction, victims, and other representatives, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important event to discuss international cooperation on how to resolve the global issue of abduction. As the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights Situation in the DPRK, as a Latin American woman, as a human being, I stand in solidarity with the families of those who were abducted by the DPRK. Joining the family members, I express my concern for and support to all those living somewhere in the DPRK, having been forcibly and abruptly separated from their families and friends. As you all know and agree, enforced disappearance, including abduction, is considered one of the most heinous international crimes as it is criminal conduct that has been a preferred practice by many authoritarian regimes around the world in contemporary times. We know well that this criminal practice is not absent from the DPRK, and it must be emphasized regarding this case that not only has the DPRK engaged in abductions of foreign citizens, but the DPRK's authorities have internationally acknowledged this crime in the specific case of Japanese citizens. This is a crime that deprives a human being from everything. It is important to let the world know that abduction takes away up the abductee's entire life. This is why it is always essential to listen to the voices of their family members in the absence of the victims themselves. For that reason, I sincerely respect the courage and commitment to advocacy that these family members have been displaying for years. I was touched by the Japanese Family Association's pledge of this year, we never give up. And I commend the government of Japan for creating space for these families to be heard and to conduct advocacy campaigns, including the students' say competition. I have mentioned my regional origins for one particular reason. In Latin America, recent history, we have been sadly familiar with the heinous practice of forced disappearance. And we are all aware of the full extent of the damage that this type of crime causes. As we say, when we, one person is abducted, in fact, a whole family is abducted. When one person is disappeared, he or she is deprived of, his fundamental, of this fundamental right of civilization, which philosopher Hannah Arendt called the right to have rights. When one person is kidnapped, his or her life and his or her family's life comes to a halt, is suspended or arrested. Every life-fulfilling project is suspended. Every possibility of joy and mental well-being becomes a denied luxury. Uncertainty takes the place of normal everyday life. Uncertainty becomes normalcy. An anxiety mixed with a faint hope covers the entirety of our conscience. This is a negative impact that abductions bring onto the lives of the family members of the abductees themselves. And it is not only about physical and psychological suffering. Their human rights, including the right to know the truth and the right to family life, have been severely violated. 
their economic and social rights have been negatively affected too. Without our resolution, the rights continue to be violated as recognized by the International Convention on Enforced Disappearances. I would like to take the opportunity to emphasize that the scope of the crime extends far beyond the individual and that the human rights of the family members also need to be protected. Family members. What I can do as a special rapporteur may be not be significant, but I am committed to conveying, conveying your messages to the world, including to other member states of the United Nations and civil society members who are working on the DPRK human rights issues. In the resolution adopted by consensus last month, the UN General Assembly condemned the systematic abduction denial of repatriation and subsequent enforced disappearances of persons. And in this regard, the General Assembly strongly called upon the government of the DPRK to engage in constructive dialogues with the parties involved and to urgently resolve these, these issues of international serious concern, including by ensuring the immediate return of all abductees. The government of the Republic of Korea came back as a sponsor to this resolution after four years, which I will come. This is the 18th consecutive year that the General Assembly passed the resolution on the DPRK. This may also add frustration to the family members because no progress, progress has been made even after 18 years of calling on the DPRK to resolve this issue. However, it is important for the state to, for, for the member states to send consistent messages to the DPRK. From what I heard from former DPRK officials who had defected, the authorities do care about the international reputation on the country's human rights situation. As I have said, the General Assembly called upon the DPRK, upon the DPRK to engage in constructive dialogues with the parties concerned. I acknowledge that there may be some tensions in pursuing the two tracks of accountability and constructive engagement simultaneously. However, these two are complementary. Accountability means that those who are responsible for ongoing and past serious human rights violations must be held accountable and need to explain what exactly happened. Accountability not only judicial accountability, but also non-judicial measures, is a critical element for achieving justice and sustainable peace. I will continue to encourage member states to take steps for judicial accountability at the international level, either through the referral by the Security Council of the situation to the International Criminal Court, or the creation of an ad hoc international tribunal or other comparable mechanism to support non-judicial accountability efforts. At the same time, engaging with the DPRK in any forum is critical to improve the human rights situation of 25 million people in the DPRK, and also to find solutions for the return of all the abductees. It seems very difficult with the DPRK under the current intensified hostility. However, I think that the problems the international community is currently focused on are too narrow. We need long-term positive change in the relationship between the DPRK and other countries and between the DPRK authorities and the North Korean people to achieve peace and security and an improvement in the human rights situation of the people. And I believe that this is why the current and former prime ministers of Japan have been sending a clear message that they are ready to talk about abductions without any preconditions. I also, I also would like to mention that even though the DPRK seems completely shut down at the moment, it does engage with UN human rights mechanisms to some extent because they are globally they are the globally accepted platform to review the status of human rights globally and make recommendations for improvement. In 2019, for instance, the DPRK actively participated in the Human Rights Council Universal Periodic Review and accepted a number of recommendations. Japan, for instance, 
The DPR uh, rights uh, recommended uh, the DPRK to take concrete action towards the early sol resolution of the abductions issue, including the immediate return of all abductees, which was unsurprisingly not accepted by the DPRK. However, this is a forum where all the member states review each other's human rights record. It is important to continue to use any opportunity of engage, to engage with the DPRK and place pressure on it because the opportunities at this moment are very limited. Finally, I would like to reiterate that this unique context of the DPRK requires all us, all of us, victims, families, civil society organizations, and the international community to work together in a united manner. I took on this challenging duty as the Special Rapporteur on August of this year, and I am ready to do my best in cooperation with all other actors. This is my first visit to Japan, and the first time I had the honor to meet with some victims' families. But I am prepared to meet and speak with anyone who is willing to share their stories with me in the coming years. Thank you very much. And Dr. Salmon, thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Dr. Salmon. Thank you for saying that you will be delivering the message of the victims, the families, and ourselves to the international cooperation. You said it's not just justice accountability, but uh, other non-jurisprudence accountability is necessary. You also mentioned that at the same time, engagement also needs to be pursued. Thank you for those advices. Next, let us ask Ambassador Li Xinhua from ROK for a 10-minute presentation. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Chief Cabinet Secretary, Mr. Hiroja Kaju Machino-san, and UN Special Rapporteur on North Korean Human Rights, Dr. Selman, and Professor Junya Nishino-san of the Geo University, and families of the Japanese abductees by North Korea, and members of relevant civil society organizations, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I am Yi Shinhua, Ambassador for International Cooperation on North Korean Human Rights from Republic of Korea. 74 years ago today, on December 10, 1948, the UN General Assembly unanimously adopted the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. It demonstrated a strong resolve of the international community to never repeat the tragedies of the two world wars again. The declaration established a normative and principled baseline for human rights that must be observed regardless of nationality, gender, or races. The core ideas of the declaration, such as dignity and rights of all human family, reasons and conscience, the spirit of brother sisterhood and the right to life, liberty, and security of person still resonate deeply with us today. This is why the agonies of our families, brothers and sisters in North Korea, who are deprived of the most basic human rights, weigh heavily hurt our mind. In this context, I would like to stress that the North Korean regime which has fundamentally responsi fundamental responsibility for the human rights violation of its people must be held accountable. As my country is also a victim of abduction by North Korea, we fully share the pain and anger of the families of the Japanese abductees. The abductions of South Korean citizens took place both during and after the Korean War. The number of wartime abductees is estimated at over 90, 95,000, including 4,777 abductees recognized under the relevant laws. There are also 516 post-war abductees. Among the latter are passengers of a hijacked plane from Gangneung to Seoul, 
fishermen on board, high school students spending time at the coastal beach, and students who are studying abroad. Until today, their families painfully longing to see their parents, children, brothers, and sisters who have not returned home for decades. Although the Korean government has continued to raise the abduction issue at the inter-Korean and international level whenever it can, it is a great pity that North Korea is flatly denying the existence of the abduction issue itself. However, the scope of the North Korean human rights issue reaches far beyond the abduction problem. Rather, it concerns various complex issues such as the right of North Korean people in general within North Korea, separated families, unrepatriated prisoners of war, detainees, and North Korean defectors. It is estimated that 10 million families have been separated after the Korean War. As of October this year, 43,160 members of the separate family are believed to be living in South Korea. However, it is heartbreaking that about 400 of these people are passing away each month due to old age without getting a chance to reunite with their family member in the North. Since most of the remaining family members are in their 80s or older, this issue requires immediate resolution. South Korean POWs here refer to missing soldiers who are not repatriated from North Korea. About 500 of 80,000 POWs or mis missing in actions were estimated to be alive in North Korea as of 2015. Unfortunately, the statistic statistics after that are unknown. The plight of aging survivors as well as their family member is a clear human right issue which should be addressed urgently as well as requires asking the North Korean authorities for accountability. Moreover, six South Korean citizens are currently detained in the North by its authorities. I am glad that following the abduction issues both for Korea and Japan, the detainees issue was reflected for the first time in the Korea-US-Japan leaders' trilateral joint statement of November 13th in Phnom Penh, though belatedly. The Korean government will do its best to resolve these human rights and humanitarian issues. As we all know, it is impossible for a single country to re induce change in the North Korean regime of its perception and behavior toward human rights. To bring about this change, the international community must pressure and persuade North Korea in a united voice. In this vein, the Korean government appointed me as the ambassador for international cooperation on North Korean human rights last July, this position that remained empty for the last five years. Over the past four months, I have been striving to raise awareness and strengthen cooperation on the North Korean human rights issues in the international arena. Also, under the principle of respect for humanity, I am making effort to reach a global consensus on how to define and approach the North Korean human rights issues. To this end, I have been held and joined various conferences and events, such as large and small online, offline, and hybrid domestic and international conferences, expert workshops, and governmental, scholarly, and NGO cooperation meetings. I will pursue them more actively next year and in this difficult and yet indispensable process. I would like to depend on the sincere cooperation and support from Japanese government and scholarly community and the civil societies as well. In addition, the Korean government rejoined as a co-sponsor for the UN General Assembly resolution on North Korean human rights in four years, as Dr. Salmon has mentioned as well. In particular, this year's resolution included new elements, such as calling for the DPRK to disclose all relevant information on the human rights violation against foreign citizens and urging the regime to sincerely listen to the voices of the victims and their families, as well as to clarify the fate and whereabouts of disappeared persons. Furthermore, the Korean government is striving to enhance the visibility of the North Korean human rights issues in the international community 
by fully supporting the role of the UN Special Rapporteur on North Korean Human Rights. And the Korean government also provides assistance with regard to the activities of the UN Human Rights Office in Seoul. Specifically, we help the office in arranging interviews with the North Korean defectors, which is crucial for accumulating objective data and information to hold the North Korean authorities accountable for their human rights violations. To promote North Korean human rights, I believe we need to pursue a two-track approach of accountability and constructive engagement simultaneously. For that, I fully agree with what Dr. Simon has just mentioned. Myself, while serving as the Special Advisor to UN Secretary General's independent inquiry into the Rwandan genocide between 1999 and 2000, I learned the importance of accountability regarding human rights abuses so that the international community can remember the stern warning of quote unquote, never again. Also, my work and experience in the UN Secretary General's Peace Building Fund Advisory Committee between 2014 and 17 made me realize the value and utility of constructive engagement. First, what we can do at this stage in terms of accountability is to keep a solid record and hard evidence of human rights violation inside North Korea and preserve it as an official document. Even if it is not possible to bring the perpetrators to justice at this moment, the accumulated evidence prepared now can be used against, against them in the future. These efforts can send out the clear warning message that they can be punished someday for their actions today, and in turn, it can have preventive effects on the North Korean leadership. Second, the international community and constructively engaged North Korea either directly or indirect, indirectly through international cooperation such as humanitarian assistance to induce the regime to improve its human rights and humanitarian situation. In particular, it is important that the international community carries out transparent and effective humanitarian assistance, which is a critical means to ameliorate the actual standard of living for the North Korean ordinary people. This is because guaranteeing basic right to life, including right to food and medicine and right to information, is also essential for improving the human rights situation in North Korea. In this regard, the Korean government has repeated, repeatedly offered COVID-related assistance to the North without any precondition since last May when the Kim regime admitted the COVID-19 outbreak in North Korea. Last September, we also proposed talks to the North on the reunion of separate families. Regretfully, there has been no response from the North so far. However, the Korean government is ready to engage in, in dialogue with North Korea at any time to resolve urgent human rights and humanitarian issues. Before concluding, I want to reiterate and emphasize again that the Korean government deeply sympathizes with the agony of the families of the Japanese abductees. We fully support the Japanese government's continuous and tireless effort to resolve the problem. When inter-Korean contacts resume in the future, I believe the Korean government will demand a prompt resolu resolution of the issues of Korean abductees and detainees, as well as the Japanese abductees to the Kim regimes. I hope that by aligning more closely in the multilateral arena, including the United Nations, South Korea, and Japan, we'll be able to speak in one voice, showing the world why the Universal Declaration of Human Rights still matters today, and why the resolution of the abduction issue is of such importance. It is my firm belief that addressing North Korean human rights issue in a broader context, including abduction issue, is a key to key and most effectively solving the abduction problems. Therefore, I would like to ask that my Japanese government and its people to be more attentive to the comprehensiveness of the North Korean human rights issues. I look forward to all of your contribution in this difficult and yet most needed journey. Thank you so much.
Ambassador Lee Shi Hua, thank you very much. In Korea as well, like in Japan, there are many those who have been abducted by North Korea. You first of all shared with us that reality. And Ambassador Li Xinhua said, as Special Rapporteur Samo said, that we should seek accountability vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. At the same time, constructive engagement also need to be pursued. Ambassador Li is in charge of international cooperation on North Korean. So you reiterated the importance of international cooperation on the human rights side of North Korea. Now, international community has to be united in dealing with the human rights issue in North Korea. There's no one country that can do this alone. You mentioned that importance of solidarity. And finally, as a message to Japan, inclusive of the abduction issue, you suggested that we should be more comprehensive as we try to partner up with Korea uh, in dealing with the human rights issue of North Korea. We have little time, but I would like to ask a few questions to the two experts. First, I have two common questions that I would like to ask both of you, and then thereafter, I would like to ask one question each to each panelist. First of all, questions common to both of you. At the moment, when we think about the North Korean problem, nuclear missile development is there. They're injecting much efforts. And in terms of the human rights issue, I think they are dismissing that as unimportant. So regarding North Korea as such, especially to the North Korean leadership, how can we attract more focus to human rights issues amongst the North Korean leadership? What can be done? Already, the two experts have suggested some clues in response to this answer. But once again, may I ask you that question? Thank you. And the second common question to both of you, we heard the voice and appeal from the family of the Thai victim. but. After the COVID pandemic, the interest towards human rights issue in North Korea has faded somewhat. And since February, the global community has encountered the aggression of Ukraine, which is attracting attention. So in this context, how can we raise the awareness and attention of the global community towards the human rights issues? in North Korea, what can we do to attract the ascension of the global general public? What do we need to do? So that's my second common question to the two experts. And let me also ask one individual question to individual panelists. First, Special Rapporteur Salman, role of UN. That's the subject of my question to you. At the moment, as was exemplified in the issue over Ukraine, China and Russia are supposed to be important players of the global community. And yet, due to their objection, there seems to be some paralysis in the functioning of the United Nations. So in this context, how, what can you do at the United Nations in order to achieve progress in the human rights situation in North Korea? How do you define the role of the UN? How can we revitalize the role of the UN? And as a special rapporteur, where are your interests lying in terms of revitalization of the role of UN? And Ambassador Li Xinhua, Towards the end, you mentioned the message to Japan, and there have been several abduction victims in Korea, and that also is true in Japan. So, of course, international cooperation is important, but bilateral cooperation between Japan and Korea is of crucial importance. So where do you intend to inject efforts in terms of bilateral collaboration with Japan. Now, I would like to ask each 
panelists to respond in five minutes, and then if my time keeping is correct, we will be able to finish within the limited time. First, a special rapporteur, Salman, would you like to respond to the question first? And then I would like to ask Ambassador Li Xinhua to respond there and after. Special rapporteur, Salman, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Lee, as well. I listened to you uh, very carefully, and I'm very happy to see that we have many common points in our approach to this issue. Well, uh, you pose very difficult questions. Uh, I think that they are the main questions of the moment, how to revitalize interests in the UN, how to deal with uh, security issues, peace issues, but at the same time, human rights, how to uh, a little bit add more elements to the discussion about Ukraine and Russia. I don't have answers to that. I need to say that. I think that we, this is an ongoing issue and we need to reflect together. But I want to say a couple of things. The first one is that uh, I think uh, I'm really impressed by the attitude uh, the Japanese government uh, policy, public policy. I think that events like these including young generations in these discussions, are a really, really important tool to, to better understand the issue and not to forget. Because, and this is my second comment, when we speak about victims, I've been talking a lot about the victim-centered approach in, uh, in my first report. When we speak about uh, victims, when we speak about victims' voices uh, in, in the case of abductions and in other uh, human rights violations, we find that uh, victims want truth, want justice, want uh, clarity, uh, the fate and whereabouts of the missing people, want uh, immediate return, obviously, and restoration of contacts. When we speak about victims, they want apology, recognition, memorialization of what happened. When we, want, when we speak about victims, they want guarantees of non-recurrence, which is very important because they are not thinking only about themselves, but in other people. And they also uh, want criminal prosecution and obviously reparations. I think that speaking about truth, justice, apology, memorialization, criminal prosecution, guarantees of non-recurrence and reparation is a good is a good way to uh, revitalize interest in these issues. We are not talking about the past. We are also talking about the present. And I would like to say what a former human, uh, Office of the Human Rights uh, uh, boss said, that we need to remember that the current human rights violations are the future conflicts of the world. We need to, re to remember that and try to finally um, to link the, re the strong relationship between peace and human rights. I don't see those issues as separated ones. I think that a sustainable peace needs human rights, and human rights need peace. Without peace, we cannot have human rights, and without human rights, we cannot have peace. Try to work on this. Uh, I think that this is an ongoing work, and I think that uh, the international community is very well aware of Japanese efforts, and well, Japan now has a very important role, uh, as always, but now in the Security Council as well, and I think that we, we will work together in the, in the future time to, to try to, to keep this on the front page. Thank you. Um, well... They said, oh, North Korean human rights issue, to North Korean regime, uh, the human rights issue is a kind of Achilles heel. I can give you one example. After the release of the COI report in 2014, the foreign minister of North Korea, uh, Ri Yong ho went to the UN General Assembly, harshly criticizing the release of the COI. Actually, his appearance is the first time in 15 years for North Korea sent the foreign minister to General Assembly. That indicate uh, how sensitively the North Korea uh, accept uh, this kind of uh, North human rights issues. Having said that, I think it is very important for us to put North Korean human rights abuses from the perspective of the G20 
general and universal, uh, like a un uh, universal human rights perspectives, so that we can emphasize the importance of the North Korean human rights issue in the context of the very basic right for the humankind. So, in that connection, um, I would like to call the, the call for call, again call for the Japanese uh, and Koreans' uh, cooperation. Uh, to dealing with the North Korean human rights issue, including the abduction issues as well. And the second question about the, why the North Korean human rights issue is kind of the being sidelined is because, uh, not only because of COVID-19, but also because of two other reasons. Number one, urgency, as uh, Nishino-san has mentioned as well, the Ukraine crisis and all those uh, energy crises and, and uh, also the U.S.-China's uh, library, and those related issues are becoming a priority, the, the making uh, North Korean issue is a sideline or back burner issue. So in order to revitalize uh, this issue, we have to do something. The number two is the, we have to overcome the, the phenomenon of fatigue. Because North Korean human rights issue as well as the North Korean nuclear issue have been there for decades. And then they said uh, over the several decades, we've been working hard, but nothing has changed. So it looks like they feel tired of this issue or kind of feel a sense of the fatigue. So in order to overcome that, we need something to revitalize this issue. One of the important things is I do believe is the US government should appoint a special envoy. Uh, Elizabeth, they said uh, together, if the special envoy is appointed from the US, they said we three can make an open just for North Korean human rights, they said. So hopefully that can happen. My la the, and then the national science last question is about what Korea and Japan can do together. Well, I think we two countries uh, could collaborate on research and advocacy effort to raise awareness of the issue and push for uh, greater action on the, this specific issue. This could include uh, conducting joint research on the human rights situation in North Korea as well as working together to advocate for change at the UN and other international community. Some may argue that tension between Korea and Japan currently make it unlikely that we too will be able to work together on this issue. However, the human rights situation in North Korea present, present us a unique opportunity for two countries to put aside our differences and work together for a common goals. Uh, by taking action on this issue, we too can show the world that we are capable of working together for the greater common goods. So the human rights situation in North Korea requires urgent action from the international community, as I said. By working together, we, Korea, Japan, have the opportunity to take a leading role in addressing this crisis and making a real difference for the people of the North Korea and try to do something for the abductees uh, from both Korea and Japan. So it is time for Korea and Japan to come together and take immediate action and collective action together. Hi, uh, Salomon. Special Rapporteur Salmon and Ambassador Lee, thank you very much for the responses. Special Rapporteur Salmon mentioned what was also mentioned by Ambassador Lee as well the record keeping of the human rights situation in North Korea and uh, try to prevent uh, the reoccurrence. You mentioned those two key points and Ambassador Lee mentioned the international human rights issue, especially the interest declining regarding inter human rights issues internationally and especially North Korea and uh, all the more so because of that situation, there has to be cooperation between Japan and Korea. Once again, we have been much encouraged by your message. And you touched upon the US government. And you mentioned that you wish to see a special envoy on the North Korean human rights situation be appointed by the US government. Thank you for those comments. Now, we took the theme of international cooperation to resolve the abduction issue as a global challenge. We were blessed with two extremely fitting panelists, and they were just appointed last summer. And 
as we try to bolster international cooperation, this symposium will be a very significant occasion to further spur such partnership. And we need to continue our strong efforts to resolve the abduction issue. And at the same time, something struck me in the uh, reading of the essays. One essay quoted words of Saki Yokota. And Sakia said, we're not criticizing the leadership, but at the same time, we have to resolve the issue and we have to hold the government accountable. But once again, we have to remind ourselves that there are people within that country that are suffering. So we have, we can't forget those North Korean citizens who are suffering. I think those were the words spoken. We talked about international collaboration of the international global challenge of North Korea abduction, and those are some of the elements we need to keep in mind as we strive to resolve this issue. We have run out of time, and this will be the end of today's panel discussion. I would like to conclude by once again thanking the two experts and give the microphone back to the MC. Thank you very much. Professor. Nishino and two panelists, thank you very much for the discussion. Please join me once again in a big round of applause. And thank you very much for coming, watching, and staying with us for a long time today. As the abductees themselves and their families are getting older, we have no time to spare in solving the abduction issue. Your further support and cooperation is very much appreciated. Please remain seated uh, until we inform you of how to exit. We also would like to kindly ask for you to uh, fill out the questionnaire. And please submit the questionnaire at the uh, box outside the reception. And please do not leave your personal belongings behind. And with this, we conclude the government-sponsored International Symposium on the Issue of Human Rights Violations in North Korea for fiscal year 2022.